Well, Dr. Musa has been introduced, but I want to say just a word about BRAC. It was founded, I think, in 1972, isn't it? Yeah. And it was originally uh, founded to help the refugees returning home from the uh, Bangladesh's War of Independence, isn't that right? And then yes. quickly, within a year, became a, a social development organization as well. I'll make sure. Right. I, I think what's striking about, a couple of things are striking about this organization. It's the largest nonprofit in the world, both in terms of people served, but also in, peop in terms of people employed. But it's followed in a, a particularly interesting strategy because it's the only organization that I know of, or it was, the, I'm sorry, not the only one, but the first organization in the Global South to expand, to export its model and expand in the Global South. And so as we go further, I'm going to come back and ask you about that strategy. But I wanted to start now talking about the largest humanitarian crisis in the world today, and that's the plight of the Rohingya. Rohingya is the correct Rohingya. way to say it. Rohingya, you, you'll help me out there. Um, coming over the border from Myanmar into Bangladesh, give us a sense of the scope, the scale of the problem, but also um, the intensity of it, the, the short time period in which it has grown so large so fast. First of all, I want to begin by thanking you, Jen, for uh, having me uh, as a representative of BRAC uh, to speak in front of this distinguished guest. Also, I thank my colleagues from BRAC who worked with all of you. It's been great to be able to come and share some of the first-hand experience that we have been having over the last few months. Um, I would say that it was 25th of uh, August, uh, 2017. Um, a nice day began. Suddenly, everybody woke up in the Bangladesh side uh, of the river Naf which is wide, one of the widest river that is in between Myanmar and Bangladesh. And they began to notice that something unusual going on on the other side of the river. And then unusual one was like a lot of smoke and fire. Mm -hmm. And soon uh, people began to notice that those fire and smoke was kind of expanding. Initially they thought that maybe something happened in one location. But they soon began to see that it's been expanding over one area to another area, as if signed up for a walking, walking fire. And it was intensity was increasing, and it still it was unclarity that what's going on, except sometimes some gunshot sounds are coming in. Because the river is very wide, few kilometers, and it's actually at a point where it falls in the bay. The next thing they noticed is the kind of flood of people coming in. It's like a tsunami. Suddenly people are beginning to come in, rushing in. Rushing in by boats, small boats, which are dangerous to use from in that rough uh, kind of river. People are coming in even by walking over the next few days. Uh, some of them working for, the, for seven days, eight days, ten days. And as they are coming in, one interesting thing was noticed that it's mostly women and children. And as you uh, know that every day there's a large volume of uh, people are coming in thousands, 70% women and children, they were uh, exhausted. They were, you could see in their face, the signs of fear, uh, signs of uh, tear in their eyes, and um, hungry, thirsty. And it's kind of a situation where you begin to feel like what's going on. And as they were coming in, they were just coming in and somehow arriving on this side of the border. They were just sitting flat on whatever situation they were in, on the side of the road, in the field, anywhere. And it was a rainy time. So it was whole, whole thing was muddy. Mm. It was overcrowding. I went there within the next few days because we uh, got the news from our colleagues. Our colleagues, we got the news because BRAC has been in that particular area operating for the last 35 years, running development program for Bangladeshi population living in this side, especially health, education, as well as micro, micro enterprises, uh, including financial service de development, women empowerment. So we had seven offices in that location with 136 employees at that time. They began to tell us the information that something happening unusual. So I went with my team. By the time I went, I couldn't actually walk 
very far there because of the crowd of people coming from opposite side. Mm. They were coming and sitting, so it was difficult to walk through them. In fact, I could see in their eyes and faces exactly the sign that I saw in the face of my mother when my mother and my uh, us, we became refugee ourselves, myself and my family in 1971 when Bangladesh had faced exactly the same situation. When my family, along with me, we ran out of our home at the face of gun, gunshots, burning, slaughtering, suddenly it started and next 17 days we were walking without food, without water, almost begging food and we reached Indian side and by the time we reached there I could see my mother, she was pregnant at that time, she was exhausted, our father got dislocated, she went somewhere else, we couldn't find him anymore for the next six months and we did not know what to do. I felt like it's again the same thing happening, mm -hmm. what happened to me and my family, where I could feel that same sense of um, insecurity, sense, same sense of fear, same sense of uh, kind of uncertainty within the face of each and everybody I met. I could see myself of my childhood again repeating yeah. in front of yeah. me. It's that look of stunned, of shock it as well. Sh yeah. At one stage, nobody was crying anymore. They like stone. Uh, they had become kind of uh, expressionless. And I could see, I could feel why they are like that because I had that experience myself. Yeah. Mm. So it was very, from a humanitarian point of view, as now I work as a humanitarian professional in BRAC, and BRAC is a humanitarian and development organization, we began to feel in one hand that we have a responsibility to support them to come out of that situation. On the other hand, it was touching us emotionally mm -hmm. because at the end, all human beings of the world are human beings. You see how the dignity and security is lost, how their f confidence in themselves are lost. Mm -hmm. You could see that sign of lost um, feeling in their eyes. You blogged about a woman named Amina, who you, who you saw there, and it sounded very much like this, but say a word about what you saw when you saw her. Amina was one of the ladies who came, and I saw, I, I blogged because I had a chance to go and sit beside her. So I saw her, that among all of them, she was one of the uh, mother who was sitting inside mud on the, f on the roadside. And her whole clothes and everything was under mud. And she had kids with her. And she was just looking vacant on the sky. Mm. And her children were just looking like this. So I went and I wanted to speak with her. She wouldn't speak with me. I wanted to speak with children. She, they wouldn't. I called my colleagues who had the language of that particular area. They were trying to speak with her. They couldn't hear anything. So questions like, are you hungry? No response. What happened? W what time we learned that she lost her husband, saw her husband was killed in front of her, sister was raped, uh, one of the children was even thrown into fire, so she lost everything. So only reason I could communicate, because I'm also a pediatrician by background, mm -hmm. so I saw in her lap while she was there, her small uh, young, uh, a kind of infant was having rapid breathing and I could say immediately the child is having pneumonia mm. and unless it's treated immediately the child may also go uh, so luckily by that time we already s we did set up uh, 60 mobile clinics and 10 static clinics by that time and those we mobilized over 24 hours because Bragg had uh, already countrywide big health program having 95,000 employees serving 110 million people every day. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I could just call upon them and uh, created uh, 50 mobile clinics having each of them having five people and then uh, 10 static clinic at the back. So I asked one of the team who are finishing their day's work after seeing many of them, I called them back and said this child need help. And I took this stethoscope myself checked and I found that it's truly pneumonia. And then I, I kind of supported that. Um, interestingly, after I written that blog, I had a chance to go back and meet Amina mm. in a tent. And that was a very rewarding experience because when I met, 
I saw her smiling. But at the same time, I saw the smile was not looking like a normal human smile. It was a mix of pain and smile. She was smiling because her that child survived. That child survived because our colleagues of that team quickly took that child back from there to the local clinic, which was our static clinic. We could immediately start antibiotics. We could also organize some oxygen because we had some uh, arrangement with a referral agency who had ambulance and in the ambulance there oxygen. We could give that, the child survived. While the child survived, she still remembered her one of the child was thrown in the fire. Uh, and uh, she, her husband was still not there. So she was smiling at me because she could recognize me. But that smile was not looking like a real smile from heart. It was like a mix of crying and smiling. It's a different mm -hmm. kind of picture. Mm -hmm. But I, I could see her. She spoke on that day. That was a difference I saw yeah. from silence of what happened to her shock to begin to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Often when we think about these kinds of humanitarian operations, we think just in terms of the, the blankets and the shelters and the toilets and the fresh water, all that needs to be mobilized to take care of the physical needs. But the toxic stress of those two children who saw their sibling murdered and father gone, um, the toxic stress of, of the mother, what, who, is UNICEF able to help? What, what agencies are able to address that part of the crisis for them? You are exactly right that one type of need is immediate basic needs. So when people came in, we needed to ensure that immediately they get something to live in, so some kind of shelter, so tents. So we quickly could put that. Mm -hmm. They needed food, they needed water, they needed toilets, they needed certain kind of uh, essential uh, blankets, clothes. So that's one type of support, and I was very fortunate that I was working in an organization where we could mobilize everything very fast. Like within 24 hours, we could mobilize 22 trucks of materials from all over the country to really start working. And then that continued over the next few days. We could quickly partner with organizations as well as partner with um, uh, private sector who donated clothes, like garments industry. 100,000 pieces of clothes we could mobilized within the next few days to give And clothes. this is the garment industry within Bangladesh? Within Bangladesh. We quickly went and said, do you want to be a partner? You have a chance. But that's one part of it, which we are doing. Um, you know that initially we began with 350 uh, uh, employees from BRAC. Quickly we expanded the size to 1,600 employees, but the remaining employees are not really BRAC's own employees. They are either from the local host communities or and from the refugee who came in. Mm -hmm. uh, we mixed them up. So half and half, so another kind of 600 from local host community, 600 from the refugees, we trained them up quickly. They become the service provider themselves. But I'm coming back to your point, the toxic stress. We took three strategies. One is we partnered with UNICEF. UNICEF has served one specific model they call child-friendly space. But we modified it because these particular children are of different types. So we partnered with them. We initially opened a few, three to begin with, then expanded to 30. And then now we run 215, 215 of the child-friendly space, which serves in which 40,000 of the children are registered. What it does, it brings kids, each of them bring kids together, put them together, and begin by putting them to start playing with each other, mm. talking to each other. It's more play-based trauma healing kind of thing, supported by some facilitators for professionals. So what we did to support that, one Rohingya refugee girl, for example, who we identified from that community who can speak the same language, maybe have education of grade eight, grade 10, we identified as a BRAC employee. Hmm. We also identified one from the local host community of Bangladesh, uh, of the same level, made them friend and trained them up initially for five days. And then every week, half a day refreshes training. And they learn how to facilitate this kind of play-based healing method. So that's one thing we are now running. Parallel to that, one second thing we did from BRAC, that we put 50 different para-counselors in the communities. Each of them trained uh, by professionals on how to do group counseling and how to do individual counselings and how to identify them who require even more specialized service. And then we have, on the back side, we have three highly trained, uh, skilled 
actually doctor psych psychiatrist who are there and then in between some groups. So they refer also cases who require further support. Mm -hmm. An interesting thing we are finding out since you mentioned toxic um, stress, our learning in this time was that it was manifesting in different ways. Initially they were traumatized, they were silent. But nowadays we are finding out that as if that trauma is coming back in a different way. Now we began to see mothers are complaining they can't sleep. They cannot sleep because of all the memories come to their head. And they're letting themselves feel. Uh, yeah, they feel in the morning they, they come feel like they're shaking body. It's common because as I go frequently and now we have now 1600 colleagues, they see it, they report back. Then, second thing, they are scared. They'll be in the corner of their tent. Mm -hmm. So even the tent is the big, like 12 feet by 10 feet, they'll be hiding themselves in the corner, and you'll almost sometimes we'll have to find out, is there a human being there? And they'll say somebody's moving. So why they're in the corner in the darkness, in the daytime? It's something like they're fearful of. So those things are coming back. So some of those we do individual counseling through prior counselors, some of the, depending on the situation. Some of them we do group counseling, some of them we then refer to the specialized groups. And so that together with this child-friendly space, and we had to create women-friendly space too. Mm -hmm. Because we realize it's not just children who are traumatized, it's also women traumatized. So we had to create separate women-friendly space. These three things together we are finding are bringing change. Mm -hmm. So we are very thankful because in that process we also partnered with some of the local non-government organizations, because there are local NGOs who are there who never did it before, but they have the language, yeah. the, which is similar to, not exactly the same, similar to this group. So they became our partner, they could help uh, be part of our journey. So we are doing things in partnership, but also thankful to UNICEF, because they are not only funding this component, but also gave us some generic tools, very general methods that we can adopt in our local situation. And do yeah. this thing. I think you, you also partner with something called Clowns Without Borders. Did they uh, we we are kind of co-working together. That was a very effective method. Mm. They came in. They were organizing kids. They were kind of um, showing jokes as clowns do, uh, and kids were laughing, um, enjoying things. That was really healing. So we are looking into partners like that because this is a situation. It's not about one organization can deal with it. Mm -hmm. It's not an issue of a government can deal with it. It's not an issue that even alone can deal with it. It's not an issue of that BRAC alone can deal with it. It's the issue where we need to really bring our collective uh, wisdom and ability together so that we complement each other and work together. It is true that BRAC is, uh, ended up being the largest responder of that area. A, because we were there for 35 years, so we had that mm -hmm. opportunity. B, we could mobilize big amount of resources very quickly. C, we could kind of quickly also, not only people mobilize, quickly really recruit people from those communities, train them up, and we had the training mechanism. We have 22 training institutions in the country, and one of them happened to be there. Mm -hmm. So we quickly used that training institution where their residential training of 700 people can happen at any point in time. So we trained them up. So we became the biggest one, but we also partnered with many others so that eventually we complement each other to do that. So you mentioned that, that no one country can, can respond. Um, one, I wanted to have a sort of a sense of the impact on, on Bangladesh because it is, there's both uh, you know, the financial uh, aspect of this, there's the environmental aspect. Uh, I know the UN raised about three hundred and forty thousand dollars or something like that. What is it? What is? What are the resources that are available? So I would say resources um, are of two types. One is resources you need for humanitarian response itself. So you are right. Um, I was also part of that praising team. Even invited me to come and share the first-hand experience in Geneva. Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity and honor to be able to come and share. So this is when the UN was looking when for donors. When was looking for there, so I yeah. sat on the dais and shared this story. We originally required 440 million dollar for f first six months, from September to February. Mm. We could raise with the generous offer. We could raise 335 million. That means still 100 million was shot in the first bout. My experience shows as this kind of situation happened, as I, you were mentioning that I had chance to work 
in Africa in this kind of situation, in Middle East I have seen situation. With time, many other crises come in the world, so interest goes down. Yeah. Uh, so even at that time we had short $100 million short. Now UN is going for second place in this month for the period of March 1 to December 31st of this year. And the place is something around $850 million. Hmm. Uh, we are waiting to see how much that comes in. but. Uh, if we exp uh, use the last time's experience where 75% of yeah. the required came in, uh, we will have a shortfall of 25%. Question is, where would that come from? Because shortage means, these are actual calculation, it's not buffer. Shortage means shortage of food, shortage means shortage of uh, clothing requirement, shortage means some of the upcoming crisis that we are about to face, and I can talk about that what are the newer coming crisis, there could be challenge in managing those. So that's one part of thing. Second part of the resource I will talk about is the local resources. So when this suddenly 650,000 people plus came in in an area where actually 450,000 Bangladeshis were living, and then we had 300,000 came earlier in an endemic manner slowly, slowly. Yeah. So suddenly what happened? There's a huge amount of pressure on the local resources. And how that happened? The, they came and settled in the areas where it was hilly, green, forested. So they began to cut those trees, A, to settle the trend, B, to use those wood for fire, um, mm. make cooking, cooking wood. So immediately deforestation become, began to be, become one problem. Many of the local community people are depending on that f those forest products, yeah. especially women. They depend a lot on forest and forest products for many of the livelihood issues, including fire, fodder, and fruits, and herbal medicines, many things. That is one of the challenges that immediately came. Second thing we saw, water. That area has very deep water table, so it is not easy to really pump water from the underground. So as a result, a common practice in that area was the surface water. People used to protect surface water, which will be filled during the rainy season with rain water, yeah. and then they'll be using throughout the life, of, throughout the rest of the year as drinking, cooking. So as these people came in, the pressure on that limited water resources. And so water, A, becoming, everybody's using, so quickly depleted, B, also getting contaminated, because the local culture was such that you protect that from the goats will not go, nobody yeah. will wash their hand, nobody will wash their clothes. This large number of people began to come, they start to take shower in that whole thing. They, they go to the pond and take shower. They, want, they started washing clothes. Difficult to stop. So that mm -hmm. created another kind of problem that water, drinkable water for the local community became shortage. So I give a, this two example. Last example I'll give that is schools, of the local schools. Many of the schools were occupied by the refugees. So children who of the local area who are going to the school, they couldn't go to school because school stopped. Initially, everybody thought this is possibly a temporary phenomenon. Maybe in uh, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, things will be over. So they were taking shelter within the schools. The schools. And many of the schools, they are reorganizing it to make their home. Partitions, these breaking it down. As a result, school stopped. So. Since then, till to date, school became a problem. As a result, organization like BRAC, what we had to do, we had to go back and start building new schools for the host communities. Mm -hmm. We are now taking large program. Uh, initially, we built 250 schools, some in the camps, some in the host communities. Now we are going for another, another 600 uh, schools because kids would have to go to schools in both sides. So these are some of the interesting challenges on the local carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. it's eventually, therefore, between the shortage of the humanitarian assistance required in terms of money for f supporting these refugees and the local carrying capacity is becoming stressed, it's a challenge for all. Yeah, yeah. As I think about it, 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 there's not just the immediate crisis, people arriving like Amina in a state of shock um, and, and with, I'm sure, all kinds of health, health issues. These are folks who've been living under stress for a very long time. And right. in situations of deprivation, when it comes to their their physical health, 
are they arriving malnourished? Are they arriving with, you know, inoculated against various ailments? Uh, what What is their level of physical resistance at the point at which they arrive? And what services do that, does that end up requiring of BRAC and others? So let me mention two, uh, I would not say story, but incidents, so that that will give an mm -hmm. answer to your question. One, for the first time in the last 30, 40 years in Bangladesh, we saw a diphtheria outbreak. Mm. And the reason we saw, and that diphtheria outbreak took place in these refugee camps. The reason we didn't see that in the last 30, 40 years, because in Bangladesh, all of the children under one received the um, three doses of diphtheria, pertussis, mm. and tetanus vaccines mm. before they reached year one, a, a, a first year of age. Uh, and it was very intensely done by the government and NGOs and others, BRAC was part of it, in a way, so that we always maintain 80% of the children are uh, above covered with the services. So therefore, you don't see diphtheria. Mm -hmm. When these people came and diphtheria outbreak took place just one and a half month ago, it was a big outbreak. Every day their kids were dying, number of patients were huge. That clearly gave us uh, an impression that these kids were not immunized. Had they been immunized in when at their home, uh, they would not have that kind of level yeah. of outbreak at the, that level. So the immunization level was not there. So I can tell you that we have a term in, we use in public health called proxy indicator. So that diphtheria outbreak itself gave us a proxy indication that the children were not immunized. But setting that aside, a uh, second story I'll tell, that as children were coming, our health programmers, as I said, that we had quickly moved 50, 50 teams. This team had five, uh, five paraprofessionals who work in the community level. They're expert in that. One of the thing we asked them to do, that take mid upper arm circumference of all the children that come up, um, below five, because that's a good screening method by which you know the nutritional status. So quickly you can do, there's a method by which you can just take the middle of the upper arm circumference, and there are methodology, uh, you see that they're below 11.5 centimeter, then child is malnourished. And we found a large number of children under that category. And second thing I was looking, asking them, that if they have taken vaccine against tuberculosis, which is called BCG, there's usually a scar. In exceptional case, you may not see it, but a scar of BCG is a common yeah, thing. Yeah. We were looking for that, we couldn't find that. All those gave us the indication that before they came, the public health service to begin with, which is a good indicator of the remaining basic services possibly they are or are not getting, either are getting or not getting, but that indication was clear to us that they are not getting the service at the level where today's in this 21st century children in all countries receive, uh, irrespective of where they are from. That's the norm nowadays. Mm -hmm. and. UNICEF was quite serious about children's health. Um, his government was quite uh, serious, but we did find a situation where they were definitely not getting basic services. So often when we, th when we talk about refugee situations nowadays, we talk in terms of uh, decades before they can return, sometimes generations before they can return. Um, back in Myanmar, their villages are being bulldozed, their houses have been burned. Do you have a sense that they have aspirations to return, that they that this is is a dream at this moment, or are they resigned? So we did a rapid assessment of that question as BRAC, because we, we need to design our program depending on various yeah. things. So I, would, I we call it a quick and dirty method, so it's not very uh, mm -hmm. uh, sophisticated one. We are going to do a sophisticated one jointly with Harvard soon, but that initial rapid assessment showed that a large portion of the people who came here, they're saying, we really want to go back provided. We want to go back because our home is there, we born there, our land is there, our properties are there, our shops are there. We want to go back, but provided you can, end, uh, we are sure that the safety security is there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're sure that we go back and lead a life without fear. We are sure that we will be able to start working and have lead our livelihood. But more important and interesting thing people are saying in response to our question about going back, more than two thirds are saying that we, there has to be even organization there 
to make sure that we are protected. And we were asking why even, and what they are saying that they don't have the trust on anybody yeah. that will ensure that kind of safety security. So they are using UN as a symbol that hopefully they can make sure that we will not be killed again, will not be burned here. So there is a desire for a large, num large number of people uh, to go back, uh, but that's why they kind of are uh, struggling that if you make sure that you do. From Black side, we always say that, you know, the when the repatriation question comes, we have to make sure that it's safe, it's voluntary, it's sustainable, it's with dignity. Mm -hmm. And that's something as we talk in Bangladesh, we also talk about that kind of thing that we want to ensure. Mm -hmm. That requires a lot of work on that side too. Yeah, of course. Yeah. There's a commission that has been established within Myanmar, and I don't know whether it's finding a way forward that would include include that return. Do you have a sense of that, or is that too early to, to know? I would say it's too early. I, I was feeling a little good by saying a few things. One, I'm sure you are familiar with that Kofi Annan yes. Commission report, which had a series of recommendations. If those are really seriously implemented, um, things should change very positively for all. But then this commission you're talking about, mm -hmm. this has, I would, I'll mention that a link with a special envoy that Secretary General of UN has uh, nominated through General Assembly in the last November, and it's going to be based in Bangkok, only focusing on Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And we are kind of keeping our hope and faith that as the special envoy of the Secretary General of UN sitting in uh, Bangkok works on Myanmar, that would be one of the key things that will be f getting focused on. And hopefully, that is one of the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. But I'm using the term hopefully, because many things are unknown. Yeah. Let's think about a, a, a brighter future for a moment. And that is, as you look at Myanmar, I mean, you're an economic development organization, not, not, just a human, you know, not just a refugee focused organization. As you look at that country, is that a country with the wherewithal for positive economic development? Does it have natural resources? Is it well s placed for trading? In other words, are the, are the basics there in place if you have the political order that's needed? You know, uh, we were quite pleased uh, in the way Myanmar was kind of uh, changing over the last several years. Uh, politically, we began to see that democracy was coming in. We were also noticing that uh, the economy is growing. Um, we, uh, as Bangladeshi, we are believers that we are entering into an era. We already entered into an area where our collective prosperity, interdependent economy with market and trade in the front is a better solution for everything and for many things than any other ways. So we were getting pleased that as Myanmar was changing positively, India is changing, that always benefit the region. So uh, it's a very positive possibility. Yeah. Uh, you are right that economy, resources, business, uh, one aspect of it, but at the end, the policy environment has to be conducive. Uh, and I believe that with the uh, democratic movement began there, uh, hopefully, we would see positive things there mm -hmm. with time. Uh, we want to remain positive, and we want to believe that our interdependent existence in that region would be the solution where market and trade would play a big role, and where democracy, our collective democracy, will provide us the uh, ultimate solution, and we'll all work together in a way that we complement each other, depend on each other, because trade would be our means of collaboration. Mm -hmm. So some of our questioners, some of the question cards I've received have talked about, asked about the specifics of the crisis. A um, couple of questioners ask about um, the fate of women. Um, you mentioned that you've put together women groups, safe spaces for women to talk to each other. We've read about sexual violence, we've read about horrible rapes, etc. Um, what, what are the particular needs of those, those women? How widespread is this problem? Um, and and uh, what, what do they most need from you, from Black? So two types of broad problems we say. One is the challenges they came with, and that is you can categorize as kind of reproductive, uh, maternal 
health kind of challenges, where you want to make sure that those who needed reproductive health services, who needed maternal health services, they receive it with in a dignified setting, mm -hmm. in privacy, mm -hmm. in a way that's needed because they have a diverse range of challenges related to maternal child health, especially some of them are raped. Some of them came with intended pregnancy. So that's one aspect of it. So as BRAC, we did set up maternity center. What we did, we did set up 10 maternity center. Ma we call it maternity, maternal child health center. And then as I was saying that we have outreach worker. Uh, with that, we added midwifery now, midwives, mm -hmm. so that they go home to home. And we identified a number of birth attendants from Myanmar communities. So in our first work, we find out who are doing deliveries when people are in Rakhine. And uh, like in my one day, I was there. I was looking for that together with my health director. And we found out three we got in, three, in kind of two hours' time. We identified three of them. We retrained them. Retool them with safe birth kits so that even if they don't want to come to the clinic, they want to do, get delivered there, we provide those services there so that safe delivery takes place. We also ensure that mothers get their own health care as a result of that. So that's one aspect. But another aspect I was saying that a kind of challenge that women face is the challenge not only women and also adolescent girls beginning there to hold, uh, uh, I mean, not only adult women, also adolescent girls, is the potential of of uh, trafficking and uh, also children also. Um, so this is traffic, they, are they at risk of being kidnapped for trafficking? What is, what is the... There are organized groups, uh, organized groups who do trafficking, who uh, take, they tell many things that will, you will get job, you will get money or they buy or they think many things. They take them and take away to various routes. It's a very organized international group. And they have their outlets there. It's a very vulnerable situation. Uh, we found out, for example, from the earlier batch of uh, refugees, uh, last year we found out a girl who was lost a year ago from the camp. Mm. She was in Mumbai, in India. Mm. And she could call her mother after one year uh, by her means that I am stuck here. She could neither come back because she didn't have all the papers required to come back uh, because when she was trafficked, somebody bought one yeah. sold, no papers are there, nor she has paper, legitimate paper there. So just to illustrate that there are groups active on it. To prevent that, we from BRAC, we formed community-based protection mechanisms. Is this a kind of very well-defined methodology that uh, professionals came up with, so by which we have 50 community groups now formed in 50 communities where uh, adolescent girls, women, men, religious leaders and others, they form protection groups, they do three things. They raise awareness among all about this potential threat of uh, um, uh, being trafficked and therefore what to do and not to do. So there are uh, algorithms to t help them learn about that. Second thing they do, they have internal mechanism of keeping eye on what is going on, vigilance. So that if there's any suspicious thing going on that people coming from outside, talking individually to a girl or something, make sure that it's what is going on. And third thing they do, they are linked with the uh, law, in, law enforcement agencies in a way that if there are challenges they face, they can call them so that law enforcement agencies come and take act, act action. But in addition, we have to do the third thing that we also see a special type of vulnerability of women that some of them get abused. Even in the camp, the violence against women, we begin to see is rising now. Mm. We begin to see... Maybe it was not reported in the past, now we see reports. Uh, we see um, even rape. So this same group also have the responsibility to, in one hand, take measures of that, but also offer health care services, offer legal services that's required, offer psychosocial counseling services to them, and making sure that where required, they do arbitration in a public setting so that those who try to do things, mm. they can get, get a kind of uh, retarded kind of say, okay, uh, this is something we cannot just go and do and go away with. So that is actively one of the program BRAC is doing. We call community-based protection program. We hired very experienced professionals who do who did that in uh, settings in Africa, in uh, Af African settings. So we have we are lucky that we got a colleague. She was she ran similar program in three different countries in camp setting. She is now there 
She's doing that in a way so that our colleagues also learn from that. We also got another colleague from Australia. She's focused, uh, specialized in violence against women. And the way we are doing this thing, that uh, we are learning it, but at the same time, all mechanisms are in place. Mm -hmm. That's helping us to keep things re in lower rate. We cannot guarantee that it's perfect, mm -hmm. but reduce it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And in the process, you're building this capacity within that community. Yeah. And when we're building, as I said, now 75% of our staff on the ground are either from Rohingya community themselves or from the local host communities who just we recruited in the last few months mm -hmm. and trained them up. They're also learning practically. Mm -hmm. So that's a skill we are building among them. So it's, and many, most of them are girls, by the way. Yeah. Uh, so, so with it is confidence. They get yeah. confident, they get skilled, and they can use that even in a job and hoping that the repatriation will take place. These girls will go back to their home and that's why we do everything in a way that they will be playing that role in the community when they will go back to their community. Mm -hmm. Because one of the questioners did ask about uh, the empowerment of women and girls in yes. the process of all this. Yeah, you know, empowerment is something that is in our mission statement in BRAC. If you have, uh, I didn't have a chance to talk about BRAC itself. Our mission statement, uh, mission means the purpose of being, it begins by saying we are here to empower or facilitate the empowerment process among people and communities who are either in poverty or either in illiteracy or disease or in social injustice. So we have all the tools and techniques, but one common thing we found out what works most in empowerment, collectivization. Bring people in collectives, in groups, and help them get networked and be together. That itself it has a high return in terms of collective power. Mm -hmm. So the situation, imagine the situation when all these people came in and most of them were in their individual camp, a uh, tent, hiding in the corner because of the fear and other things, bringing them back, putting them together, 10, 15 of them, talking about, beginning with venting about each other, what happened to each of you. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling my story, one other mother is telling her story, who lost children, who lost husband, who are raped, they're talking to each other, taking from their how do we then now take control of our lives? So there are facilitation that you have to do. So we employ facilitators to really bring them. This collectivization is one of the key tools that brings them power. So this women-friendly space I was talking about, mm -hmm. one of the key things is do that it brings women together and facilitate the discussion in a way so they talk. And the discussion is now changing. We're beginning to say they're now talking about need to send the children to the school because they are out of school for a long time. So while initial discussion was the traumatic discussion, sharing what, who lost what, now they're talking about that uh, we talk together discuss that can you do one school near our distance or this, mm -hmm. this cluster of tents so that we can send our kids there and we are responding to that. So nature of conversation and changing and we feel good that that is giving them gradually power to take control of their lives. They are now asking things that they feel futuristic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so so part of that long term is both education but it's also livelihoods. And that is one of the complex things we have to work on. We are working on it now. On the livelihood part we are working on in a way that in one hand uh, people who are refugees they are not by definition supposed to work mm -hmm. in the normal communities. But we try to figure out, can we create a livelihood that is interdependable with the local community and them? I'll give a couple of examples. One is job creation itself was creating livelihood. As I said, people are getting job. But second thing, I would say, i just give an example, that as refugees are cutting trees, and after tent building, they're cutting trees as firewood. So we said if local communities, where host communities, they begin to create, uh, prepare something called a husk cake. And husk is from the rice, the husk you the take husk it, and then you can turn it into cake. So local communities make it. And then they sell it to the refugees because, and sell against commodities. So like they were getting relief as rice, pulses, oils, they don't eat lentil. They wanted to trade it with, uh, on the other hand, local community eat lentils. So they are trading. So they're trading. Trading. Yeah. And then uh, they are eating lentils. They are buying the uh, husk cake, 
cutting tree was going down. So we had to innovate some of this methodology in a way that we create this market-based interdependencies among them, knowing that, as you said, that they can be here for quite some time. So more kind of interdependence we create where there could be win-win, better situation we create for them to have more peaceful coexistence mm -hmm. as much as possible. But other challenge I didn't mention, an upcoming challenge that we are really worried about now is a potential monsoon. Not potential, monsoon is coming. Yeah. Uh, Bangladesh uh, always face uh, rain, and rainy season is uh, two months from now. And that area where they came in, uh, that is a landslide prone area. The moment normally um, rain comes, the hills landslide happen. It's been going on for many times. This time they even cut the tree. It became more vulnerable. And many of the tents they built were just at the bottom of those hills. So we are now working with them to relocate some of the tents to far away so that they can take care of that. So that's one of the monsoon related challenges we have also coming up mm -hmm. soon. It's different than the challenge we have faced at the beginning. So one of our questioners asks whether you're finding any hostility from the local community, but it sounds like the no local community is getting quite integrated into the response. No, I, I, then I would be painting a too much rosy, rosy picture. For, sorry for that. <laughs> we are trying to figure out so that we build that uh, market-based solution. And as I'm saying solution, that means problem, problem is started. We began to see tension when the tree cutting started. You know, first four weeks was best week in a sense, the local host community is very welcoming. They're giving them food, they're giving them water. As I was feeling like when I was, I was, I was a refugee and I was going to near to India, first few weeks was easier uh, because we got everything, but then it became tough. So same thing here. After four weeks, local host communities began to see that, hey, our trees are being cut. Yeah. Uh, our water source is getting spoiled. Our kids cannot go to school. And the trucks of relief are coming and going to the scams, not to us. <laughs> so tension began. So this small, small uh, conflict started. Up to the level where we had to do two things. One, as I said, that um, create market-based solution. But also, we had to put together conflict resolution. <laughs> Mm. That the techniques that we use that identify connector dividers, you know, Mary Anderson's technique that we used to use in conflict resolution at the community level, we have done that conflict resolution method to really uh, start bringing the reconciliation. I would not say that it's succeeding or beginning that thing. It's much more complex. We begin to see that situation is getting, we control in one side, it goes wrong on the other side. It is complex, so we are not thinking that it will be everything fine. Uh, it can get even worse. So we are preparing for ourselves to minimize that kind of thing yeah. as opposed to... Uh, so a couple of the questioners did ask about the length of time that this was, you know, how sustainable is this over time? And in part, not just how sustainable is it in terms of finance, um, uh, the financing of it, but how sustainable is it in terms of, of, of whether or not the local community uh, will tolerate this much disruption? It is a complex question, my friends, whoever asked that question. It's a question we are grappling with too. Um, because when you talk in Bangladesh side, everybody will say, including UN, government, communities will say, the origin of the problem is in the Myanmar side. The mm -hmm. solution is in the Myanmar side. So re safe, secured, voluntary, and dignified repatriation is the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, so therefore, when it talks about sustainability, uh, sustainability is that. Yeah. On the other hand, we know the reality, that it may take long time to create that condition. That's why I refer to this Kofi Annan Commission's recommendation that was just published in the August 25th. Yeah. And you might say a word about those recommendations, what the yeah. content was. There are <laughs> it was a comprehensive set of recommendations. There were 88 recommendations, uh, to some extent overwhelming. <laughs> and the reason, why it were, uh, the reason it was 88, uh, I had the chance to review it several times, and I went to Kofi Annan Foundation Commission's office in, uh, in Geneva to discuss that. Uh, 88 was like sectoral, so for ensuring basic health services are ensured to this group of people. These are the six recommendations. Ensure that for the education part, these are the recommendations. To ensure livelihood is taken care of, these are the recommendations. Ensure peaceful coexistence is uh, built between 
uh, these Rohingyas from Rakhine and non Rohingyas, uh, they call Mogs, in uh, uh, that community, build this peace and coexistence there, these seven recommendations. So, together, there are 88 recommendations. What has to be done next step is the implementation. And implementation has to be done in sequence. You cannot do all the 88 at a time. So, what are some of the high leverage, high priority, low hanging fruits? Identify those that will give maximum possible benefit, critical ones, most strategic ones, and focus on that, maybe five or six. Then maybe next six months you do some more. Now, the role of implementation, however, is on the hand of government of Myanmar. Mm. Um, and of course, state has a role, Rakhine state. So that together, uh, if they generally implement that, it will take longer time. But over time, there's a potential of changing the situation where there could be peaceful coexistence and even peaceful market-based relationship between all groups there. And because that's the solution you want nowadays. Mm -hmm. but and of course, there are other aspects to this crisis. There are the internally displaced there as well. And I know that that isn't, uh, isn't the focus of Brock, but Brock is involved with economic development yeah. in Myanmar. And so that's a, uh, an important piece. It, it, I, I, I wonder about, and some of the questioners ask, the degree to which in the end you could, and Brock, despite its size, uh, could get overstretched, because this is not the only crisis. It is simply the one for which Brock is absolutely essential. Right. Brock is in a unique position to play the role it's played, not just because of its location um, and issues of language and culture, et cetera, but also because the coordination of these kinds of complex emergency situations, coordinating with lots of different agencies, both government and non-governmental, local and international, this is, this is what your own personal experience has been throughout your career, but the experience of Brock, putting it in a unique position. Is there a risk of being overstretched? Yeah, of course, there are risks. Uh, one of the good things is that, as I said, that this is a collective response. It's not just BRAC's response. And even this response is coordinated by both government of Bangladesh and United Nations together. So uh, that coordination mechanism initially uh, was having some challenges. With time, we began to see it's a more systematic now. So when we work, we work under that coordination mechanism. So BRAC is one of the actors and few other actors are there. Uh, number of local or non-government organizations, international non-government organizations, as well as government and even are working together. And we share our responsibility. We are kind of reorganizing our responsibility based on our comparative advantages, based on our collective strengths. So in that way, as you share responsibility and gets coordinated, chance of getting stressed is reducing. Mm -hmm. Of course, it would be. But the other part I would say about BRAC itself, you know, why BRAC was born in the first place? BRAC was born to be on the side of the human being, people who are in crisis. So that was the purpose. We began by saying we exist because there are people who need us at the time of their poverty, injustice, exploitation, discrimination, and illness um, time. So if that is our core, uh, we cannot be stressed. We cannot get exhausted. We can face constraint, figure out ways to uh, engage, figure out alternative innovative approaches, the, the low cost, and maybe more community-based, that's our strength, how do we engage community people who will participate with us together with Deliver Solution. But we'll be losing our purpose if we feel like we're overstressed, we cannot do that, because the whole birth of BRAC was for that kind of purpose. That's why we exist. So what have you learned from this particular situation that can be applied elsewhere? One important, we, we have enormous amount of learning this time. Uh, it has been a learning experience for all of us. But one thing we learned that a humanitarian crisis is not just a theoretical one. Theoretically, everybody says, all science and all projections is saying that in the, over the time, both frequency, magnitude, and complexity of disasters, be it man-made like this one, or be it natural, are going to only increase in the world. And we are thinking maybe that's uh, something uh, will be coming later. 
But we began to see those are things are on our door and can happen anytime. So important thing we learned that we have to remain prepared, prepared to deal with issues and that could be of high magnitude. And that could come at a speed. So in this time, we, one of the good things we could do that as people who are refugees, they came like tsunami, flood, we also, from black side, responded with a huge surge with speed. And that was possible for us because we were there. But we took the lesson from there that we are working in a number of countries, 11 countries now. So, and we want to put a team who will be specialized in that surge of response in humanitarian crisis, wherever needed, given the fact that our world, both because of climate change, which is one of our core area of work also, and because of man-made challenges and various other things, could face this kind of challenges from nowhere, suddenly, to a large scale, and we need to be standing beside the people because people need us at that point in time. That's one of the learning that we have to build that capacity. But we have so many learning we learned from this whole thing that all those are uh, giving us the reflective uh, requirement to really figure out so how we do things differently, how we do in a way so that people feel like it adds value to their difficult time. Mm -hmm. I just want to I want to end by asking about you personally and and professionally because uh, you speak with such feeling uh, about this experience. Your whole life has been your whole career has been devoted to uh, both humanitarian assistance and long-term development. You're originally from Bangladesh, yeah. would have lived everywhere else uh, in, in your career. This, this last few years, this, this role, this executive director has brought you back home. Yes. Does it feel like home? <laughs> Are you glad to be brought back home? What is the meaning of this role for you at this time in your life? Thank you for asking that question. I feel very fortunate that I could come back to my home after 23 years of serving in multiple countries. As I was doing the similar kind of thing, but learning in different countries. And some of the countries like Sudan was difficult. There are a lot of uh, internal displaced people. People are fighting. In Tanzania, I had to deal with refugee camps, uh, a similar situation, but it was different. In Rwandan situation, I had to work in a similar situation. Also, I had to deal with uh, refugees in Thailand when Cambodian refugees came there. But after all these years of working in humanitarian and development work, as I went back to home, I feel fortunate that I can bring a lot of learning and be with, uh, and share back with the colleagues I have who are extremely dedicated. BRAC is an organization where I have seen people don't just work. They are not just professionally competent. They have the, they, they believe in the cause for which they work. They genuinely believe in the field for the people. So when you can blend your tools, techniques, methodology with the right kind of mindset, right kind of heart, then you can really maximize impact a lot. And I've seen it this time. Just to illustrate, the first situation we observed in this Rohingya situation, I went to the field. With my team, we went to field, spent the whole day seeing the situation, came back to our um, uh, hostel. We have back hostel there. At 8 o'clock in the evening, we took half an hour to take shower and food. And then we sat down to discuss about how we are going to respond from day after tomorrow. And the first planning meeting went up to 2.30 in the morning. Everybody was in full strength and because they wanted to make a difference. And that meeting ended up with instruction that in the next one hour, we are going to call to all 64 districts of the country at 3.30, 3.30 in the morning, call to ask them that tomorrow, by 10 o'clock, they should be able to send X number of latrine materials from anywhere in the country. And that led to the next night, 22 trucks of latrine materials arrived in that area. And all those happened because people wanted to make a difference. And the reason I'm telling this story, that I feel very fortunate that I could bring back tools, techniques, methodology, and experience, and really be with the group who are committed to make a difference, and who are really mean it, so they would be with me uh, for up to 2.30, but more importantly, they would allow me to work with them uh, so that I can feel part of a team which is different. So it's a great uh, feeling with, with which I work here now in BRAC. BRAC is indeed an extraordinary organization founded by a remarkable man. 
now led by another remarkable man doing really uh, the most important work I can imagine. So please join me in thanking Dr. Musa. Thank you very much.